Luke chapter 4, I'm going to begin in verse 14 where the Bible reads, And Jesus returned to the power of the Spirit of Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues. And being glorified of all, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up as his custom was. And he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And what I want to preach to you about tonight is the healing the brokenhearted. Healing the brokenhearted. This is something that the Bible says that Jesus came here specifically to do. To heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You know, Jesus, one of his main reasons for coming here was, yes, to save us, but also to heal us, to give us hope and to heal the brokenhearted. And that's important for us to understand because there's many of us uh, that are brokenhearted. There's many of us that, you know, anybody that's lived for any length of time, and unfortunately even today, many people at a very young age learn what it means to have a broken heart. Something happens in their life, something tragedy takes place, and our hearts are broken. And <clears throat> it's important that we understand that we have a Savior that is familiar with being brokenhearted himself. And we'll see that here at the, towards the end of the sermon. But I want to point out, first of all, that that's what Jesus came to do. And Jesus came here to heal the brokenhearted. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for this reason. Why did God put his Spirit upon Jesus Christ? One of those reasons was to, to heal the brokenhearted. And you know, that should be our mission as well. Amen. And we should go out and we should desire to see people who have broken hearts to be healed. And of course, we do that through the preaching of the gospel. But beyond that even, you know, people need to uh, understand what it is to, to, to be able to bring their burdens to the Lord and leave them there. People need to understand that there's a God of all comfort that, that comforts them and wants to help them and wants them to, uh, to leave their burdens with Him, help them to carry that load that they carry through life of a broken heart. And what I want to point out, first of all, and you know, I know it's late, and, or it's, it's Sunday night, and we've got a busy work week ahead of us, and you know, we've been out soul winning, and, and so on and so forth, and it's cool here in the building, and we're coming out of the heat, and it's, it's you know, I have a very soothing, relaxing voice, you know, and you know, I, I've got a face for radio, so it's easy to close your eyes, but what I, I'm going to look at a lot of scripture tonight, okay, but I, I want us to, to pay attention, because a lot of this is, is very important, if you would, Go over to Mark chapter 6. Mark, chap Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read to you from Psalms 103. The Bible says in Psalms 103, The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He, maketh his, he made his ways, his, known His ways to Moses, His acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. You know, sometimes we get so one-sided with God, how we view God. Sometimes we get this one-sided view of God you know, and it could go either way. Some people, of course, they run to the other extreme where God is nothing but love all of the time. You know, in us and in, in the new IFB churches and in our, in our stripe of churches, sometimes we, we get so disgusted and fed up with the just the nonstop love. And you know what? God is love. We understand that. But we also understand that there's another side to God, that God is one that executes righteousness and judgment. Yeah. But sometimes even we can run all the way over to the other side and forget that God is also merciful and gracious and slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Amen. And that God cares about the brokenhearted in the world. He says he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. You know, God isn't always, isn't always love, but you know what? God isn't always anger either. God is both. God, God is multifaceted. He has, he has many layers to his personality. <clears throat> he says he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is toward his mercy toward them that fear him. That's a lot of mercy. And I don't know about you, but I'm in need of that mercy. Yeah. So the, 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 what we need to learn to do here is to fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That's a great promise out of the word of God. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man... His days are as grass, as the flower of a field, so he flourisheth. But he says there at the end that God knoweth our frame. He, know, he knows what we're made of. He knows what he created us from. And what did he create us from? The dirt, right? He formed man out of the, the, the dust of the earth. And God hasn't forgotten that. Then he looks down and he sees us 
And he remembers that our frame is as dust. That we're weak, that we're, uh, you know, we're, we're vulnerable at times, and that we break easy. God understands that we break very easy. And it's not very hard to break a human heart. This is something that can happen very easily to any one of us. In fact, if we were to go around the room and talk about it, I'm sure everybody in the room has experienced this. And I'm not just talking about, you know, I had some crush in junior high, you know, and she didn't write back the note. I wrote her the note, do you like me? Check yes or no, or maybe. And she checked no and handed it back. Oh, my heart's broken. It might feel like the world's ending, right, when you have that kind of pup. I'm talking about real heartbreak. When life happens, when real tragedies take place, when things aren't going our way, and we don't understand what's going on, or somebody does us wrong, or somebody fails us in some way. You know, people walk around with broken hearts all the time. And one of the reasons why is because they're made out of dust. We're weak, we're frail. You know, the reasons why other people hurt other people People that they even love, you know, they do, they, they do them wrong. It's because they're dust. They're sinners. They're flawed. And God looks down and he says, I remember that they're dust. And he's not going to always chide and be angry forever. And he's not just, you know, sitting up in heaven with a bat just waiting for us to step out of line. God is plenteous in mercy. He's long-suffering. And he was sent here. He sent his son to do what? To heal the brokenhearted. Amen. And we all need that. Because we all have broken hearts. You're there in Mark chapter 6, look at verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and he told them all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. And there were many coming and going, and they had no, no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed in a desert place by, by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and, knew, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and went after him, and came together unto him, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, said, oh, here we go again. Oh, I've got to deal with this, these people again. What do they want? Why don't they just leave me alone? Is that God's attitude? Not at all. But sometimes that's our attitude, isn't it? Somebody comes to us, they have a burden. They're brokenhearted about something. Something is going on in their life that has them down. And we're just like, yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Yep, oh, I know, you know. They're, they're, they're weeping. We bring them in, you know. Okay, uh, all right, that's enough. <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing. That's not Jesus' attitude. You know, we shouldn't have that either attitude either. It says, and he was moved with compassion. You know, when we see somebody going through something, when somebody's going through a trial, and they express what they're going through, and they're, they're hurting, and it's obvious, you know, that should move us with compassion. Say, you know, not that I can maybe even do anything about it, but at least I could say, man, I, I feel your pain. I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm sorry you're having a hard time. It, it should move us. <clears throat> we should care about healing the brokenhearted because that's what Jesus was here to do. It says he was moved with compassion toward them because they were sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He just saw them just wandering around, just not knowing what to do. And he decided to have compassion on them. Go over to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Look, we have this, this ministry because we received mercy. You know, maybe we had a broken heart. Maybe we were downtrodden. Maybe we were as the sheep without a shepherd. Yep. And God was long-suffering towards us and showed us mercy. And you know what He's done? He's given us this ministry. Amen. And part of this ministry, yes, it's to preach hard against sin, it's, to, it's to, to rail on this and rip on that and go out to do all, and do all the hard things and, and, and fire and brimstone. And I get that. But let's not forget that we also have this ministry to do what? To heal the brokenhearted. Amen. To go out and reach the lost and tell them that there's a Savior in heaven that loves them and cares about them. Amen. He says, therefore, seeing we have, have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So it sounds like we got quite the ministry. 
We're preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. For God, who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, the hearts that were broken. God is shining in them now. To do what? To help heal the other broken hearts that are out there. He hath shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in what? In earthen vessels. We're dust. God remembers that we are just weak. <clears throat> and that's the way he wants it because it goes on and says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. But, Jesus knew it when, uh, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him and the scribes and elders said, he saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down, down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also. So he's not just getting it from the religious community. He's getting it from the degenerates that are up there with him. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. <clears throat> You know, God knows what it's like to be made fun of. God knows what it's like to be mocked. You know, and, and, and we say, well, you know, we always try to play it out. Well, it doesn't get to me. And, and you know, some of it probably doesn't get to us. But I'm, I'm certain there's sometimes if the right person said the wrong thing to us, it would get to us. It would hurt. We'd say, why do they, why do they have to say that? Oh, it make us angry, make us sad. It might even break your heart. But Jesus sat there and he endured all that. So he knows exactly what it's like. It says in verse 45, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the, all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud cry, with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, if there's anybody in this world that knows what it's like to be abandoned, it's Jesus. Right. You know, I can't think of, you know, there's a lot of things we can suffer in life. One thing a lot of people go through is, you know, abandonment. And they, they have a parent that leaves at an early age. They, they go through some tough thing in life. They feel forsaken. People forsake each other all the time. People that should be there aren't there. They've forsaken you. You say, why does that happen? Well, they're dust. They're sinners just like us. But you, you know what? If that's you, or whatever it is in your life that maybe has broken your heart, God knows what it's like. God knows what it's like to cry out and wonder and not understand and say, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, he's broken here, emotionally. Not just physically. There's an emotional breaking of Christ here. He's not just, that's not just scripted. It's like, oh, okay, this is the part where I say this. I mean, he's saying that from the heart. Because God really forsook him. God turned his back. His father, whom he had known, from the beginning, turned his back and said, I can't look at you. Because he became sin for us who knew no sin. All, the, all of our sins were put upon him in that moment. God, who just couldn't even look at his own son, and, God, and he said, I'm forsaken. <clears throat> and it says, And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. What I'm trying to get across by turning this passage is the fact that you know there's no pain that you feel that he has not felt you know whether it's emotional whether it's even physical you know it, maybe we go we get some disease or we get some ailment or maybe we just start getting old <laughs> i don't know what it's like but i hear <laughs> that when you get to a certain age you start to feel all the years catch up to you you start moving a little slower the joints are, don't bend as easy as they used to. and Everything, you just have these mystery pains, right? Or maybe it's more severe than that. Look, I don't care if you're broken emotionally. I don't care if you've been broken physically. God knows what that's like to have gone through that. There's no pain you have felt that he has not felt. If you would, turn over to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. I mean, let's look more at this, this physical pain that he went through. It says in verse John chapter 19, verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a, full vi a, vessel, a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop to put it upon his mouth. And I've heard people try to explain this like, well, they used vinegar because, you know, it really cuts thirst. I'm like, have you ever drank vinegar? Yeah. You know why they put, why are you give them vinegar to drink? Because it's cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, that's right. You know, I'm even, you know, I'm not going to say it's, it's the right thing to do, but, you know, when they, when they used to execute people, I don't know if they're executing anybody anymore, but when they used to ex execute people in this country, they would give them a last meal. I don't know, maybe that's just an urban myth or something like that. But they'd say, what's the, hey, what's the last thing you want before you pass off this, th this earth? You can have one last thing, whatever you want. Oh, vinegar. Because I'm really parched. And I need that extra, you know, do you think that's what's going on here? There's no last meal here. There's no kind send-off. It's like, oh, you're, you're writhing in agony and thirsting? Have some vinegar. That'll help. <laughs> when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, <coughs> because it was the, the, sap, the preparation that the body should be not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that the Sabbath day was on a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and the others which were crucified with him. You know, and we could talk about this. Why are they breaking the legs? Well, that's, that was so they would suffocate and die because now they have no way to, to push themselves up on the nails to catch a breath. It says in verse 33, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. So why did he not break his legs? Well, they said, oh, he's already dead. Well, just to be sure, let's stab him with a spear. Because if I don't care if you're, I mean, if you're faking it, you know, you're going to wait, you're going you're gonna to cry out. You're going to say, oh, no, he actually is alive. You know, just like when the kids are pretending to be asleep or something, and he's like, oh, let me give them a little tickle, you know. And you find out real quick they're actually awake. <coughs> you know, that wasn't, of course, what was taking here. They're stabbing him, literally. But it says there that when they pierced his side, forthwith there ca uh, came there out blood and water. And that's, always, that's a very interesting um, observation that John made there. And what I believe it's showing us is that, you know, Jesus, of course, died. You know, he gave up the ghost. We understand that. But I think what the Bible is trying to show us here is that when God died, when Jesus died, he died of a broken heart. He died of a, bro a broken heart. There's a thing called... Uh, hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock. And what happens, and this is a condition that happens when you suddenly lose a lot of blood. And if we know the story of the crucifixion of Christ, that's indeed what's been happening to Christ. He's lost a lot of blood or fluids from your body. And this blood, uh, this drops your blood volume, the amount, of blood, uh, the amount of blood circulating in your body. And what that leads to is that your heart has to beat even faster. Because there's no pressure and there's not enough blood to send through the body. So when you lose all this fluids, your, your heart rate increases and it stays increased. It's not like you just take a few deep breaths and calm down. It's a state that you remain in where your heart's just, just beating fast because there's no pressure. And it's trying to circulate blood, the little bit of blood that's remaining to the, the, the organs and things. So this leads to rapid heartbeat, which leads to what's called pericardial effusion which is excessive fluid surrounding the heart. So when your heart's just at this high rate, just beating nonstop, this, this pericardial effusion takes place. And what that is, is excessive fluid around your heart. You know you have fluid around your heart. But then, for some reason, when this takes place, the heart just, just becomes enlarged even more, or the, the sac around it, rather, is enlarged by this excessive fluid. It's too much that's there. And that shows us that when they pierced that side, that's what was taking place here. That Jesus died of a broken heart. And what I'm trying to get a point across tonight, I'm saying is this, is that God knows what it's like to have a broken heart. And if we're here tonight and we have one, God knows what that's like. And I'm not just saying physically. I'm saying he knows what it's like to go through emotional anguish. He knows what it's like to deal with these things. And you know what? That's why he has compassion on others. <clears throat> And here's the thing, you can't live with a broken heart, can you? It's a hard thing to do. You can't do it physically, that's for sure. You know, I don't recommend you try it if you're doubting me. You know, the heart goes, it's over. You know, but you can't live with a broken heart spiritually either. 
You can't be what you need to be for God if your heart is broken spiritually. If you would, turn over to, go over to Ecclesiastes 7. We're almost done. But the Bible says this, in Ecclesi- go to Ecclesiastes, it says in Proverbs, you're going to Ecclesiastes 7, the Bible says in Proverbs, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. You know, there's a lot of physical things that our spirit can endure. <laughs> I mean, you'll read these, these stories of survival and it just blows you away what some people can endure just to survive physically. Their spirit is what carries them through. You know, I remember I've read that story of, of, of the men that got, you know, stranded in the Antarctic right before the First World War and were stranded, like, in the Antarctic with no, like, just abandoned out there. There was no hope of rescue. And the way that story ends is just amazing. It was, it was Shackleton and his journey of the endurance. He was, it was a vessel that was going to go. He's going to be the, one of the first men to try and cross the Antarctic continent on foot. And he ends up getting in the pack ice and, if, and, and, and has to abandon the ship, watches the ship go down. He's there with, I believe, 30 to 50 men. I'm not sure exactly how many. And now it's his job to get these men. And mind you, this is during the time when there's, there, you can't just, you know, co- you know mayday, mayday. That, no, that's not happening. There, no one's coming down to the Antarctic back then. You know, there's no whaling vessels nearby. You're abandoned on the middle of the pack ice on the bottom of the world. You know, most people would say, oh, well, I guess that, that was a good run. But, I mean, these people, they, they managed to survive. You know, your, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. A lot of us can go through life, we might have some physical ailment, we might have some physical handicap, but our spirit helps us to carry through. We can sustain a lot. But the Bible says, but a wounded spirit who can bear. But a wounded spirit who can bear. Look, if our spirit gets broken, you know, the physical is not going to carry the spiritual. You can't say, well, I have a wounded spirit, but I'm in great physical shape, so I'm good. Nope. Now, you can be out of a terrible, you know, and I'm a walking example of that. You could be in terrible physical shape, and your spirit could carry you right through. But if the spirit goes, the spirit's broken. If the heart breaks, you can't live spiritually. Not to the fullest that you should what happens with broken-hearted people is that they often become bitter. The Bible says a sound heart is the life of the flesh. You know, a whole heart, a complete heart, a, a healthy heart is the life of the flesh, but envy, rottens, it, 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 but envy the rottenness of the bones. You know, people who have broken hearts, they get bitter, they get envious. Oh, they didn't, they didn't have to go through the things in life that I had to go. They don't know what it's like to do what I had to do. and They don't know, why did I have to suffer this? They had it easy. You know what? They might have, and maybe those people never did have to go through the things you went through. But here's the thing. You being envious and bitter and angry, all that's going to do is rot your bones. What you need to do is just let God heal you. What you need to do is just realize that maybe there's a purpose behind having a broken heart. Maybe, maybe there's some good that can come out of it. And you're there in Ecclesiastes. Look at verse 7. Or excuse me, Ecclesiastes 7. Look at verse 3. It says, Sorrow is better than laughter. Sorrow is better than laughter. I don't know about that. Well, that's what the Bible says. Sorrow is better than laughter. It'd be better to be sad than to be laughing, the Bible says. Why? For by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart is made better. Maybe that thing that's breaking your heart, maybe that thing that's bringing you down is to make you a better person. You know, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and talk about all my problems, but, you know, we, I'm sure we've all got them, and I'm sure we've all had things happen in our life that made us sad, maybe even to the point where it broke our hearts. And we can sit here and we get bitter, and we can get angry, and we can get envious, and we can rot our bones, and we can, you know, fail spiritually, or we can realize that maybe there's a reason our hearts are broken. Maybe God allowed that to happen to make us better people. So that we, like Christ, could have compassion upon the ignorant. Compassion upon those that are also brokenhearted. I mean, that's why Jesus is able to look down and say, oh, they're just dust. I remember what it was like to be tempted. I remember what it's like to have physical pain. I remember what it was like to be tired and weary. I remember what it was like to be mocked and ridiculed. I remember what it was like to be in physical and emotional anguish. And I will have compassion upon them. Maybe that's why God lets us 
go through these things so that we could be like Christ and have compassion upon others. The Bible says the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. <clears throat> you know, going, th going through mourning, uh, being through, going through sadness, that's what's going to make you wise. <clears throat> you know, you shouldn't envy others who haven't suffered. Don't envy others who haven't gone through what you've gone through. What you should realize is that if they knew any better, if they were wise, they'd be envious of you. It sounds strange and it sounds backwards, but it's the truth. They should be envious about the fact that I'm made wise. They should be envious about the fact that it's better for me to have gone through what I've gone through and be made a better person for it. They should be envious of me, not the other way around. <coughs> Look, Jesus knows what it's like to, to be brokenhearted. And you know what? And, and, and I don't want us to get this idea that all God wants us to do is just walk around. Well, the Bible says it's better to mourn than to laugh, so put on a frowny face when you wake up. I don't smile because I'm trying to get wise. You know, there's still, of course, a time to laugh and a time to weep and a time to rejoice and a time to lament, so on and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm just saying, if you go through some heartache in your life, don't get mad at God about that. Don't get mad at people around you. Realize that that might be the very thing that God is trying to do to use in your life to make you a better person. Yeah. And you know what that should do? That should give you hope. Even when you're going through that, even when you're going through some dark time, some valley, some trial in your life, you say, why is this happening to me? Well, maybe it's because God's trying to make you a better person. Trying to, to soften you up and make you a more compassionate person. Maybe make it so some more time in the future you, you'll meet somebody that's going through something similar and say, hey, I know what you're going through. And help them, encourage them. That should give you hope. Did I have you go to Revelation chapter 21? I <clears throat> probably didn't. No. Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> if you're going there, the Bible says in verse 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had pa were passed away. <clears throat> and it says, uh, And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And then there's these great few verses here. It says in verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Look, there will be a day when God just wipes all that away. And that should give us hope. You know, we're going to have to go through some things in this life and, and there's a purpose behind it, but there is coming a day when God's going to wipe away all tears. And it says, There shall be neither no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that's great and we look forward to that, but that's not today. That's in the future. That's something that's going to happen afar off. You can't expect that to be the case right now. And here's the thing, it's not going to be because God has a purpose behind what he's doing. And I think a lot of the reasons why, sometimes the reason why God allows us to have a broken heart is so that we could help the brokenhearted. <clears throat> you know, we love to read these verses where it says, you know, God's going to wipe away all tears. But here's the thing about that, you can't wipe away tears that haven't been shed. If you aren't, if you're, there's no tears, there's nothing to wipe. There's no pain to take, get, to take away. There's no sorrow to do away with. There's no crying to stop if it's never been there to begin with. So that's what I'm trying to get across here is that, you know, yes, we're going, we have tears now. Yes, we have sorrow, but the hope is that one day they will, that will come to an end. You see, if, we're, if we are, <coughs> let me just end by saying this. We live with broken hearts that have been healed, okay? You know, if that's us, maybe we could say, look, I, you know, my heart was broken. I went through this, whatever, and God has healed me. We live with broken hearts that have been healed, but we don't live with hearts that have never been broken. And it's not like, you know, 
people get this idea that some, they're going to get over something in their life. And what I found is that really tragic things that happen, you never really get over. You just kind of realize that that's the way it's going to be from now on. And you stop being angry about it. You know, the healing is when you stop being angry about it and you don't get bitter, you just accept it. And you understand it. And you live with it. And you look forward to the day when, you know, it will be taken away. But that's not going to happen here. There's not going to be any therapy session. There's not going to be some drug that's just going to make that go away. What you have to just learn to do is live with it and accept it. And thank God for it. And, you know, use it to help other people to heal the brokenhearted. Let's go ahead and pray.